You are going to feel the energy today from both me and our guest, Hilda Labrada Gore, who also has another name. She's called Holistic Hilda, and we're like sisters from another mother. You, you may have already met Holistic Hilda through a very famous podcast that she produces and hosts for the last seven years called Wise Traditions. And this is a podcast for people who want to optimize their health based on an ancient wisdom. And it's sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation, which is known for its mission to bring back nutrient-dense foods to the American diet through education and research. And guess what? The podcast has now reached over 10 million downloads with over 400 interviews. That's quite the achievement. Now, Hilda is a certified health coach and an ancestral health advocate who explores the world, learning about traditional lifestyle practices for optimal well-being. And she shares the best of experts and experiences and epic adventures, not only through the podcast, but also on her YouTube channel and website. Both are also called Holistic Hilda. And she also shares a ton on plenty of ancestral health tours and conferences She's quite the ball of energy. So without further ado, meet Hilda Labrada Gore. Welcome. Zora, thank you for having me. I only don't go by Hilda the Explorer because you're Zora the Explorer. So <laughs> <laughs> we do have so much in common. So I'm really excited to share some things with your audience and to get to know you better as well. Oh, so great. Yeah, now we do have this great connection. And and like me, you also love to travel. And I love watching your YouTube videos and your Instagram stories of all your adventures. So, you know, whether it's a podcast interview or a travel to a new land, you're you're very much like me. And you, you try to look out for those locals and you get into their culture and traditions and you go off the beaten path and you observe how people are aging around the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess this is why you call yourself also an experiential anthropologist, which is such a cool, cool word. And, and I would love to know more about some of the women that you've met along your travels and, and what we can learn from them. And in fact, you have three of them who stand out for you. So tell us about them and, and what a woman going through menopause can also learn from them. So I was in Mongolia last October. I can hardly believe I had the privilege of going there. And it is the most sparsely populated country, I think, on the planet. In other words, there are, let's say, three million inhabitants of Mongolia, and you know, two and three quarters million are in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. So you can drive for miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers and not see a single soul. Um, but you will see yak and camels and wild horses. I mean, it was epic in every sense of the word. So I got to go to the Gobi Desert, actually, and meet some nomadic Kazakhs. Some of the people groups that are there in Mongolia include the Kazakh people. And I met this 88-year-old grandmother. And she was so beautiful. She was so beautiful. She welcomed, welcomed us into her gur or yurt. Uh, they call them gurs there and served us the very traditional milk tea. They make this tea with the yak milk, too. And that's kind of their breakfast, basically, is milk tea. And we got to have a lot of their local foods, which is really just meat and fat and dairy, anything they can get from the animals, because hardly anything grows in Mongolia. But anyway, so this grandmother, I literally was like, I must interview this woman, even though we didn't speak the same language. I grabbed my guide. I was like, come on, let me grab my phone. Let me do what I can here as I like to do. And I asked her a few questions, but one in particular stands out to me. I asked her like, how did your parents take care of you when you were young and sick? Because, you know, my show is about ancestral health. And of course, here on Hack My Age, we're talking about how can we live optimally through all the years. And she said, we had no concept of sickness when I was a child. I wasn't sick. She goes, we didn't even understand what that was. Can you imagine? <laughs> like <laughs> that? Wow. That is unbelievable. That's hard. I know. That's really hard to believe. Um, but that's, you know, even if she's exaggerating, it's you probably didn't get, you don't get sick that much at all. Right. No. I mean, that's amazing. Well, she Why is not? the second person, the second person in my travels who said that to me, the first was a Maasai elder. He said, we never got sick. He said, if we felt a shiver coming on, we would drink milk from the cow and he would demonstrate drinking it straight from the udder. Like, <laughs> so she is not alone. I think people 
who live according to these wise traditions, who still follow the health ways of their ancestors, who are, you know, getting that sunshine and grounding and in community, in the context of community, they're eating nutrient dense foods. I think they just thrive. Now, this is not to say that at 88, she doesn't get sick. She didn't tell me anything about that. She did say that her eyesight was dimming, but I could see that her quality of life was joyful. She kept laughing with me and patting my knee. I mean, she was just charming. And finally, I did say kind of like, what's the secret? You have to ask every mm -hmm. elder you meet, you really, what's the secret mm -hmm. to healthy living and life? And she said, she literally said, family is everything. Oh, and that's, that's what the Harvard study says, right? <laughs> adult development. Yeah, <laughs> it's so beautiful. You know, think about I'm so glad you're in Spain right now because they get a, a feeling of that. You get the feeling of the family there. But in the U.S., we're kind of segmented. You know, the, the kids live here. Their parents live there. The great grandparents are over there. Everyone's all over the country, depending on their job and their career, whereas in many of the indigenous communities I visited, the, the people are still together. The family members live together. As a matter of fact, yes, her son and his spouse were caring for the animals because the Kazakh people are herders. So mm -hmm. they had uh, probably some goats and some camels, as I recall. So she's right there and her husband's right there. And she had six kids and I think she had over 40 grandkids, you know, mm -hmm. not far so I didn't ask her how often they come over for dinner and all these things because the, <laughs> the conversation was a little stilted through an interpreter. But I thought, how beautiful and how important relationships are. I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned the, the Maasai tribe. And I went myself, after I climbed Kilimanjaro, we went to the Maasai and experienced what it's like there. And uh, and I was, yeah, similar diet, goat milk and meat. They didn't have many vegetables. Uh, nothing grows there. And when I, and I same like you, I have the camera asking and interviewing. And I said, uh, I asked about, so we had a guide who spoke English. The guide was, Mas was Maasai and, uh, or maybe it was an interpreter. I don't remember, but he asked that this person was about, man was about 30 years old, more or less. And I started, I asked about his parents and he said, oh, my dad is not, uh, my, my parents have passed away. And I was like, oh, sounds like they died early. And he says, no, at 35, that's normal. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay. So maybe they don't get sick. Maybe they just get sick and die early. I don't know. Well, it kind of goes to what people say now when they're like, we shouldn't eat like our ancestors because they died young. But sometimes it's the ravages of nature that will do them in. I think, you know, a, a camel hoof to the head or for the Messiah, it could have been um, an attack by a hippo, you know, it could have been anything. So we don't know the circumstances under which they died, but I can tell you this, it's very unlikely that they died of any modern or Western disease, like a, a heart attack or diabetes or something, you know, because they're eating their traditional diets. Again, they're in their communities. They've got their ancestral context. I, I do think it's likely that it had to do something more with a, an attack or nature or something. I, I think we misunderstand uh, why the people were dying so young, you know, if indeed they did die. We don't have all the evidence in for sure. In Mongolia, I mean, do you know, what, did you ask what the average age is uh, of mortality or did you get an idea or did it just seem like there were a lot of elders everywhere and they were in their 70s, 80s? And oh, I, I, I haven't been to Mongolia yet. Yeah, um, I did a little research and it seems like the uh, mortality rate is in the 70s. So this mm -hmm. woman had surpassed that. Um, but again, there is the modern lifestyle in the cities. There's a lot of coal burning and that comes with other um, toxins and irritants. So when they're burning the coal in the middle of their gur. You know, they're keeping mm. themselves warm, but they're also breathing in things that I'm sure are not good for the respiratory and the overall health. I will tell you this. I got to sleep in many girls. I was there for two weeks and not just in this family's home, but I traveled around. I was nomadic myself. Mm -hmm. And when I would sleep in a girl where they would shovel in the coal in the middle of the night, I sometimes found myself like wide awake. And I'm like, why am I wide awake? And I realized, oh, it's what comes with the coal. When in 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 contrast, they would shovel in manure, which was the traditional way to keep the fire burning through the night. I was Yay. fine. I was like, give me more manure, please. I did not, <laughs> not want the coal off gassing who knows what into the air. You know, it's just really interesting. So modernity 
is is creeping in and i think that's affecting people's health and mortality rate as well um yeah, I've like I've said, I've and you said at the intro, I've done a lot of travels around the world. I've also done some research, but I don't claim to know it all. So I'm sure there's some things I have yet to learn. But I I just love it. I'm driven by this kind of like wanderlust that you have and this insatiable curiosity to learn more. So if you'd like, I can tell you about the second woman that I I looked up to and I learned a lot from on my travels. Yes, go ahead. Okay, well. I had the privilege in Australia in 2019 to connect with a woman who goes by the name Suzanne Thompson. She's of the Inangai tribe. And uh, just like in Mongolia and even in the US, you know, there are various tribes of indigenous people. And uh, so she was of this particular tribe and I met her outside of Barcaldon and the Northern territories there in Australia. At any rate, she told me, she's like, Hilda, I used to want to be a hairdresser working for a Vidal Sassoon salon. I'm like, okay, that's, that's nice. She goes, but now... She says, I am custodian over the land that was once occupied by my people, you know, by my ancestors. And it was acres and acres and acres of land. And a side note, Zora, the reason I'm saying custodian is because in their belief system, no one owns the land. It belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. So she didn't want to say this belonged to my people, but obviously they were there (laughs) and inhabiting it. And she took me on a walk and we would see etchings and like, prints of like emu feet and hand prints made with like blood and spittle and urine and they would spit it onto the hand onto the cave wall and then the the stuff would get absorbed into the rock and here hundreds of years later it's still on the rock like it was just blowing my mind the kind of things you would only see in a museum I was like wow I get to see it up close with Suzanne Thompson and she told me she said the reason I switched course is because I started listening and paying attention to my dreams, to what my ancestors were telling me. And they were calling me to take charge, to take custodianship of this land. And she's not the only Aboriginal woman I met who said, we have a custom in our in our tribe called Dadiri. And it's a time of deep listening. And I thought, wow, if we could adopt the habit of stillness, And in our go, go, go world, it's not easy, right? But if we can adopt that habit of stillness and quiet, who knows what we could hear and what we could learn about our purpose and our path. You know, we might hear the voice of our ancestors like Suzanne did, or we might hear the still small voice of God or our own inner deep knowing that's saying, go this way when you know very well you should, but you've been tamping it down because you, Mm -hmm. you know, think, oh, I've got to hustle this way. It's just fascinating. So that, that, idea of deep listening and deep knowing really stuck with me. And so it's something I've tried to incorporate into my own life as I do breath work and prayer. I'm like, okay, can I be still, you know, to listen and hear what I'm here for? You have to filter out the chatter. The When anyone who meditates or has tried to meditate, it's not easy. You're, you're the, the inner chatter does not shut up. It's like, why do you keep talking? <laughs> and you, it's really hard to sit still. And so there's, I think with this kind of, to be still and hear and listen, because I'll do that, you know, I'll sit on the beach and I'm meditating and oh my God, my brain just doesn't stop. And then I'm like, shut <laughs> up. Cause I want to connect with my mom who's passed away a long time ago. I was mm. like, I want to hear what she wants to say. And it's, it's it's really hard, you know, so it's yeah. not like it just happens. So I think it's almost, you need training or maybe your ancestors need to guide you on this. I, and I would encourage people to, to not give up, you know, because it, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't think it comes easy to anyone. I, what do you think? Well, I think this is why like they call yoga and meditation practices sometimes because you've got to <laughs> get in the space and make space. Um, And I have a confession to make just so people don't think I'm there yet. Obviously, you might know if you know me at all, I'm not there yet. But um, so I've decided to incorporate regular breath work. So in the morning for 20 minutes, I do the four, seven, eight breath. It's a calming breath, helps you get into that parasympathetic mode. And, you know, it's quite meditative, actually. Um, and I was talking to my friend, Mary Reddick, and she said, if you do that twice a day for 20 minutes, like it's supposed to really help your heart rate variability anyway, without getting too much into it. I'm like, I'm in, I'm in, but do you know when I do the breath work, when I'm driving (laughs) and I don't know, it's not exactly the stillness, my, you know, Aboriginal friends were telling me about, but I'm like, you know, at least I'm doing it. 
and it does calm me and it's a practice. I want to get to the place where I can do the breath work. And sometimes I do, don't get me wrong, but in a place where I'm just still and I'm more open to whatever I need to hear, right? But in the meantime, I'm driving along and doing the breath work and it, pro it probably helps me manage traffic better. And it is working on all the things in my system, my autonomic system, but it's just funny. Um, but I do think it's it's just so beautiful and it's a stillness. It's something, you know, I come from a Christian faith perspective and the Bible says, be still and know that I am God, you know? So there's a sense in which, a lot of religions have this idea that we need to be still. And when we are mostly human doings instead of human beings, I think it's a good word for us today. Such a great saying, uh, human <laughs> human beings and not human doings. You mentioned, I have to make a note on the breath work. I'm so proud of you, first of all, for practicing. And I'm, I I done my breath work training through the Oxygen Advantage. Uh, I've only done ah. that. You know, I know there's a million and one practices, but I really want to understand the science behind it because I've had some experiences with some of my clients and I realized how powerful the breath is. It just blew mm -hmm. my mind. And what I've learned, this is a note for anybody out there, is through the, once I've got certified, I had several encounters with several people who were in like a panic attack or having deep stress. And, and I was like, yay, we can now, here I come to the rescue and let's <laughs> practice this, you know, technique that I just learned. And there was no way I could get them to breathe. And they were in such a panic. It wasn't the time. And I went back to my instructor and I was like, hey, dude, this stuff doesn't work. Like, what? Well, come on. <laughs> like, I just mm -hmm. tried it. And he said, it's because you don't, you need to practice this beforehand. It's a tool in your toolbox and you pull it out when you need it. You don't just learn the ropes when you're falling, free falling down and trying to get yourself calmed down. So what you're doing is practicing in the car, practicing when you wash the dishes, practicing before you go to bed or right when you wake up, like anytime. So when I teach people, it's functional breathing is what I teach. It's not like a pranayama mm -hmm. or something to do, you know, just for an hour. It's what I teach is to do it every single moment of your life. Keep your mouth closed, breathe through your nose. And, and I think when you're able to do that, when the time comes that you really need it, you know, you're going to know what to do. And even just happened today, actually, someone came in just going through, you know, a terrible time in her life. And I was like, that's, she, I wanted her to take a nap for 15 minutes. She hadn't sleep for three hours. I mean, she only slept three hours the night before. And I was like, you got to take a nap. She tried. I can't, my mind's racing. Told her to start breathing, counting four and exhale six. And then we tried, you know, the four, seven, eight. And um, it was really hard and, and she, her mind was somewhere else and, right. uh, and it did, you know, eventually did calm her down a little bit, but it, it's like, she didn't have the patience for it, which is typical. You just, yes. You, and look, I, that's why maybe this tool, <laughs> the way I framed it will help people practice anywhere, anytime. What I learned, I think I interviewed James Nestor who wrote ah, you know, breath, great. the new science of a lost art, you know, and I talked to Josh Trent, who's a well, wellness and wisdom podcast. Anyway, I've heard a lot of people talking at me about the idea of breathing, but I didn't become intentional about it until actually I started doing ice hole plunges, which might be too far for some of us. That is one way to hack your age. But another way is to slow down your breathing wherever, whenever you can. Why? Because I liken breath work to a toilet paper roll. Um, you want it last to last a long time. Your life will be extended if you breathe less and slower. So I used to think life was measured in terms of heartbeats, but now I think it's actually more having to do with breath. So you want to breathe fewer times so that your life is extended. So that's a little hack my age tip I thought I'd toss in there. Absolutely. I did a little post on um, what I called it, breathe less to live more. And then yes. I did a little explanation. Yeah. And about the HRV that you mentioned, I, so if anybody wears an aura ring, the biohacking community, we have these little computers on our hands or straps and wrist things. And if you do a breath work practice of some kind that's supposed to make you feel calm, you will see your heart rate variability go down, uh, go up and your heart rate go down. Heart rate variability is the, is the measure of stress. So if it goes up, that means you're less stressed and you're managing fine. So it's amazing because you, you can actually see it. I mean, you may feel more mm -hmm. calm and that's really great, but I, we're, you know, biohackers like data, like we like to see the data and get all excited <laughs> about curves and lines and, and it's just amazing. And I see that different breathwork practices have different effects. 
So if you like to play around with, with gadgets and things, um, you, you really can see your heart rate come down. You can feel it, especially for, I think, women going through menopause who I'm training right now through the, a program. And we're using breathwork techniques because if you wake up in the middle of the night, which is not unusual for a woman going through menopause, how in the world are you supposed to fall asleep again? And the breath is there. Well, we could talk about breath. Like, I'm sorry, you just really <laughs> nailed me. <laughs> and it no, just, that's going totally off fine. But yeah, let me let's let's talk about the the third person you had on your mind. Yes. Well, this woman, oh my gosh, she made a huge impression on me. Mama Rosita. I met her in Ecuador in 2021. And she goes by Mama Rosita because that's one way in which in Ecuador they revere their elders. They call them Mama, mother. Uh, it's really a, a sign of respect. Like um, I think in in Spanish speaking countries, they'll sometimes say Don, you know, Don Juan, you might've heard that name, you know, it's like a, a sign of respect rather than sir or ma'am. But anyway, so Mama Rosita is a curandera and a partera, a healer and a midwife. And she was working in tandem in a beautiful collaborative union with this local hospital to allow traditional Quechua women to come in if they wanted to give birth in a place where if there was any high risk emergency situation, it could be taken care of, but if they wanted to do it in according to their own traditions. So without any invasive procedures or interventions, unless, you know, medically or deemed necessary by the, the parents. So Mama Rosita would welcome them in her, you know, regular traditional clothing in a space that looked like a home without all the white and the white coats, because actually white in the Quechua culture, it signifies poison or death. So they did not want to <laughs> go anywhere near a hospital. You couldn't blame them. Um, so she would let the women, um, and I say let, but I mean, she would enable for the women to deliver standing if they wanted to, or squatted or holding onto a rope. She was demonstrating all these positions to me. And it was just, it was so beautiful. So having been a midwife and collaborated with this hospital, having delivered, you know, countless numbers of babies, when I interviewed her in Spanish, she kept repeating this one phrase. She kept saying, Nuestro cuerpo es sagrado. Nuestro cuerpo es sagrado. Our body is holy. And after some time, I let that sink in. And I thought, wow, if we could honor our bodies, if we were really cognizant of how divine and beautiful they are, I think we would live differently. You know, we... We tend to mistreat ourselves when we shortchange ourselves on sleep or think, whatever, I'm just going to grab these cookies because I'm hungry right now. We're not thinking, how can I really respect this body? So it was a call to awareness, really, mm -hmm. awareness of how beautiful this life is and how we want to nurture our body. And, uh, you know, just like God said, or Jesus said, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, like, do not neglect yourself. You are sometimes kinder to others than you are to yourself, right? Um, my daughter and I were talking about this the other day, how... You know, if you're on your own and you're working, you'll just kind of eat whatever for lunch. But if someone else is there, you might say, hey, let's have something. And you make something deliberately with intention and love. And it's just funny how we don't give ourselves <laughs> that kind of treatment. So I felt like her call was one to be aware and to honor our bodies. Mm. I like that. I always say your body is your temple. Treat it yes. with respect. Yes. It's so true. I absolutely agree. So, okay. We've learned. Um, so one was um, family is important. Mm -hmm. That was you learned in Mongolia. And then we said, what was the other one? I think I interrupted you with the breath work and she, it was in it's Australia. Just stillness. 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 She was Suzanne Thompson, but yeah, stillness. Stillness. And then self-awareness or self-respect, you self know, those three pieces. And yeah, keeping family close is really really beautiful. And that doesn't mean there's always going to be harmony, right? But we grow when there's discord or disagreement and we learn to reconcile. There's something really beautiful. I think I used to, I don't know, tease my family because we we met somebody one time at a, like at a park and the lady's like, yeah, you know, blood is all you got, you know, take care of your family. Blood is all you got. It's all that counts <laughs> or something. And I was like, what? That's so silly. But now I kind of know what she's talking about. Like there are special ties with those to whom you're genetically connected doesn't mean you can't form a new family doesn't mean you can't you know make some space for a time if there's something that's really unhelpful to you and you need to detox from something in the relationship that's not good fine i'm not saying that but there's also something very very special about learning about coming together time and time again 
despite the differences and in the midst of differences to love one another. So mm -hmm. yeah, three, three beautiful things from three beautiful wise women. I love it. Thank you. Okay. We're going to keep those. I'm going to put those in the show notes. So the three things that I've learned <laughs> from Hilda today. Um, so, so then we, we called this podcast episode, embracing your wise elder. So I'm guessing maybe this is how can we apply what you've learned to yourself or what did you really mean by this? Yeah, it's a good question. I think for too long, Zora, I'm going to be very real here and say, I feel like I wanted to pretend I was 25 still. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally met someone recently who was in her 70s and she's like, I don't know how I got old. I thought I was in my 30s. <laughs> I think it's good to have a curiosity about life. Like I'm really very childlike in a lot of ways. And I think that's good. I don't want to negate that. But I also have a new sense of the calling I have to be um, who I am and not pretend I'm something else. And uh, this goes for when I was back in, you know, middle school and I wanted to sit at the cool kids table, you know, and I was trying to fit in so hard. And after a while, I got tired of it because those cool kids were mean. I was like, <laughs> you guys are not <laughs> nice to me. Why am I trying so hard? So I backed off and I sat at a different table and it was beautiful and it was lovely. And we made real connections and we cared about each other. And so that lesson I'm kind of relearning now that I don't have to be 25. It's better that I'm not 25 or even 35 anymore because I have many years of experience that I can share when asked. I'm not going to blast people. That's also what comes with time is a little wisdom. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I'm going to wait until people are curious for me to share thoughts with them that they want to hear. Otherwise, they're not going to want to hear it. Unsolicited advice is never welcome, really. <laughs> um, you know, just think about it. If someone's like, you know, you could do this differently, Zora. And you're like, mm did I ask you? No, because why? We tend to put our defenses up in a kind of protective stance. But if on the other hand, you said to me, Hilda, you know, I know you're a podcast coach or you've traveled the world a little bit more than me ask, you know, then yes, I'm all in. So keep the, I would say I'm learning to keep the curiosity of a child, but also embrace the experience and the wisdom I've accumulated over time and to share it when, when asked. Mm, that's a great advice. I, I, I think the key for some, it's, it, I don't know how easy it will come or if it's just natural or naturally happens or naturally doesn't happen. But when in gerontology, we learn that um, wisdom does not come with age. It's not like a given. Okay. Mm. There's plenty of older people who are not wise and there are plenty of younger people because of experiences they actually can be very wise. There's no age. We just have this, we just assume it and we say it, but it's, well, at least the research then that was presented to me in my mm -hmm. studies was that it's not. And you go, oh, wow. Yeah. And I kind of, I could see that because I, I know older adults who are very wise and have great advice and other ones. And like, there seems like they're still trying to figure their life out in their seventies. <laughs> like, okay, well, there's just everything. <laughs> and so I think the, the key is, yeah, how, we can learn from experiences and be able to, to transmit. And I think part of it key is like you said, is, is unsolicited advice is not, is not, not the key. So try to be there and, and also try to form things. I'm always, even with my kids, I was like, I want to give wise advice, but sometimes I don't feel like I'm there yet. <laughs> I'm still learning. I'm like, okay, I want it to be so profound and say something really amazing that they'll remember for the rest of their lives and share with their grandkids. <laughs> but you know, it's, I think it takes time. It takes cultivation, it takes experience and, and, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll get there. If you want to, I think you can. Right. Well, there are two things I want to say to that. First of all, more is caught than taught. So your children are picking up your vibe, your essence, and it's much more powerful than words. So when you feel like, okay, I want to say just the right thing, don't worry because you've said it in so many other ways over the years. That's one thing. But the other thing is just a moment ago, Zora, you said, you know, I'm still learning. I'm not there yet. I think that's part of wisdom is recognizing our limitations, you know, not in a way that we're self-imposing them, but realizing here's what I know and here's how big the world is. So there's a humility that when cultivated with curiosity and learning, you know, serves us well and may make us wise, whether we realize it or not. So that still learning posture is one I adopt. I'm a a constant student of life. And I think it served me well and is only going to make me wiser. Maybe the people who are immature are the ones who think they've got it all figured out. 
Mm, you're right. And Kim says, we don't know what we don't know. Yes, <laughs> so true. Here in the chat. Yeah. So yeah, so let's let's move on. In the in the biohacking community, we all understand chronological age versus biological age. But you brought something new here. And you you were telling me about biochemical age. So what is, what is this and how is it different than biological age? Yeah, great question. And I know the big reveal is coming soon, by the way. <laughs> you challenged me before we even started recording a few weeks ago, or maybe it's a couple of months ago now. You were like, Hilda, why aren't you telling people your age? And I was like, it's an age of society. And you're like, but how is that going to change? You know, so yes, I am going to get to the big reveal. Um, but before we get there, I will answer your question. So chronological age is how many years you've been on this earth, obviously. It's the number of years. Boom, that's it. Biological is often assessed through markers having to do with uh, your DNA methylation, you know, how your body um, manages inflammation, fight or flight, and so forth. And they can actually assess that with lab tests and whatnot. You know, you can actually see what is my biological versus my chronological age. The biochemical age is more of, as I see it anyway, it's more of an assessment of your own on how your body manages energy. It has to do with energy metabolism. It has to do, do I have the energy to do the things I want to do? How does my body respond when I get sick? It's not that I never get sick because usually we all do have setbacks. Some people even see these as upgrades, which I think is really cool. It's not that I don't get sick, but when I do, how do I bounce back? So it's measuring my energy. So that's why I can say with confidence that even though I'm chronologically 61 years old, biochemically, I'm much younger and I don't need to put a number on it, but I just know why, because I feel like I'm ready to go at any given time. I really, I'm not saying this to brag. I'm mm -hmm. saying this with gratitude that I have the energy to do whatever I want to do to travel across the world and not worry about jet lag, you know, to, um, ice plunge off and I'm going to Minnesota in two days, you know, I'm going to be jumping in the ice and doing all the things I want to do. And I do them, of course, judiciously, I'm not trying to hurt myself or, you know, I am aware of my age and stage, my chronological age and stage, but I'm also uh, challenging my own previous thoughts about what it would mean to be older, because I remember my younger years, I thought, oh my gosh, in the year 2000, I'm going to be 40 or whatever, 41. Like that's Oh, that's like <laughs> so old. That's so old. And now I'm like, heck no, that's nothing, you know? So I'm I'm really grateful for this, you know, biochemical youth that I have where my energy is sufficient for all the things I want to do. I can bounce back from things easily. I have that resilience and probably the proper, you know, mitochondrial function that's allowing me to live my best life. Okay, I have two questions. How do you measure the biochemical age and two, what did you do to make it so well, quote unquote young or in, in a, have enough energy to do all these things that you want to do? Yeah, I'll answer number two first. Um, I have to be honest and give credit where credit is due. My mom is from Mexico. My dad is from Cuba. They were both and are both fireballs. Like they are just like huge energy. They met at a dance. They never stopped dancing. My father is now 91 and he can do pull-ups. Like he's just fantastic. My daughter went with him to Spain like two years ago. And um, at the end of the evening, he'd be like, okay, where are we going next? And like, everyone else is like, wait, it's, you know, 1030 or 11. And he's like, let's go. Like he was just ready. I'm like, <laughs> so I know in my genes, I've got that kind of chispa, sparky energy going on. Um, and number two, I have not had a scientific biochemical assessment. It's just my own. Um, but I, I think you can measure it by how often do you think I'm tired? You know, like, and it's okay. It's okay to be tired. But if you're feeling that way frequently, it may be that you don't have enough balance. As we age, let's face it, like, um, I'm not going to pull an all-nighter anymore because I don't want to. And I actually know how bad it is. But even if I wanted to, um, it probably would take me longer to recover than a 25 year old, let's say. So I'm not going to do that. So I have some hacks in place. I think that have really helped me. One is I really do honor my sleep. This is in contrast to my father. <laughs> um, but I do, I go to bed and I do have an aura ring that helps me mm -hmm. keep track of it. But I, I go to bed, you know, when I should, let's say between nine and 10, I make sure I'm in bed literally, uh, between eight and nine hours. And then I wake up so refreshed. So 
I am not grabbing a cup of coffee. I don't need a snack in the middle of the day. I don't get that mid-afternoon slump. It's amazing. Like, that's amazing. So honoring my sleep is one thing I do. The other thing I do that helps set my circadian rhythm and also gives me energy is I get that early morning sun. And I know you've probably talked about it here before. It's just really important to sync uh, with nature's rhythms and help your body get tired when it should get tired at night when the sun goes down. And But the sun is actually providing nutrients to our mitochondria it revs the little engines in our cells and this is why some people are called breatharians actually they don't even eat food they just exist off the sun power um they're called breatharians but it really has to do with the sun so anyway this is fascinating stuff but there i say the sleep and the sun um i do call it shivers i have alliteration you know um and food that nourishes i think i call that sustenance and spirit. I do things that lift my spirit. I think that might be one of the most important of all, Zora. I know I'm on a little roll, but let me just mm -hmm. say, like I, even if I did all the right things, even if I ate a good diet and I plunged in those, you know, ice holes and I, you know, got the morning sun, if I didn't do something that lifted my spirit, that helped me connect, some people call it the higher self, but I would say would to God, you know, help me to connect to something bigger than myself. I think I could still be downcast and and almost be older than my mm -hmm. chronological or biological years. So I I sense this fatigue actually in a lot of 20 somethings and even younger that I come across sometimes. They just they seem dejected, they seem unhappy. And it's not because they don't have some of these other things, it's because maybe they're missing that spirit piece, you know. So I really also guard my energy. I don't uh just squander it away on whoever. I don't spend time with people who are as they call it, you know, energy drainers or what have you, like, I don't do that as, or I avoid it if I can, you know, I um, do things that make me happy most of the time. I love conversations with people and I get outside. So look for things that boost your energy, look for simple life hacks to help you use what you've got. And you may find yourself in this very place where I'm at, where I feel, you know, much younger than my chronological years and, and can live as if I were younger too. So I think we really are sisters from another mother. <laughs> it's, we are exactly the same. And I see, I, I have these same practices as you and same beliefs. And I have the 28 day menopause energy reboot program going on right now. And you hit a lot of those things that we talked about. The number one uh, hack is is knowing who yourself, knowing who you are, or like you would have, you know, that spiritual connection. You know, you need that. You know, that's important to you. We talk a lot about um, family and and friends and relationships and all these things. Where I really put them above the the ice bathing and the red light therapy and you know getting out in sunshine. I I, think I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. You know when you imagine if you have this higher purpose or you know who you really are and and understand your needs and get them fulfilled, you almost could have a bad diet and no exercise or you know you're still going to be thriving. You know all the rest That's is right. kind of icing on the cake. So I really love what you said and I I reson that resonates with me and and everything that that I'm about to. And can I add one thing, especially to those going through menopause right now, um, it would be easy to have a victim or woe is me feeling about it. Like, oh no, you know, I'm getting older. Oh no, the night sweats. Oh no. But I think a part that's linked to spirit is mindset. So in the middle of the night, when you wake up, you know, yeah, you can breathe as Zora was suggesting. You can also pray, like lift up others. Um, don't see yourself, if you can help it at all, as a victim, because when you do that suppresses immune system function as well and makes everything worse anyway. So like, it's like, instead of, you know, crying that it's raining, why don't you think, oh my gosh, that's great. It's helping the plants grow. It's just a little <laughs> mindset flip. And one thing that helps me is gratitude. So every day I just write a few things I'm thankful for in a little journal, the more specific, the better. So it's not always just like family and friends and the sunshine, you know, like I'll say, you know, that my dog, you know, drank the raw milk this morning with joy or whatever it is. Like I try to get specific, you know, and sometimes I'll even write down things I don't like. So I'll be like, okay, the fact that whatever, let's say this person didn't call me back, you know, that's painful, but I know there's a lesson there. So I, I write down everything and I work for that attitude of gratitude, not just to write it down in a rote way, but to feel it. And that flips the script. So instead of being victimized by menopause, you could embrace it. You know, some people call it the change. We're constantly changing all the time anyway. So don't think this is the ultimate big C change. It is a change. You're changing from one moment to the next. Think about Niagara Falls. 
it has the same name, but it's never the same water every time. It's mm. constantly churning and changing and flowing. So just know this is a change. There are other changes every moment of every day and look for what you can be grateful for even when you wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> words of wisdom already. <laughs> I am so glad you mentioned in that, you know, the gratitude and positivity and not being a victim and all this stuff is, is really important. And I'm exactly the same. I think I'm like you, I think they're sort of naturally positive and looking for the, the silver lining. And what I'm learning though, is that if you, there's this thing called toxic positivity, and I never mm -hmm. heard of it until just recently. And mm -hmm. it's, actually ignoring the negative. Like, I don't like, I'm, I hate being a victim. I hate that mentality. I hate um, people who complain. So I don't complain. Like it's, 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 it's one of those things that ingrained me, but I'm learning that actually you need to honor those feelings. You need to yes. honor that they exist. It doesn't mean you have to sit in it and wallow in it, but if you ignore it and what you said was write it down, even if it's something that didn't yes. resonate. And that I think is, is really important that nobody really talks about very much. I'm glad that you mentioned that because it's true. We are wired similarly and I like to be positive, but that doesn't mean bypassing an emotion. Like I need to recognize, oh, that hurt me or this was sad and this was hard. And that is a step in healing. It's like exposing the wound uh, to the air. So that's good. Maybe it doesn't need to be either or, right? You recognize it and you're grateful. Um, a little phrase a friend of mine taught me recently is thank you, sensei. I guess it comes from martial arts, you know, thank you, teacher. And somebody did something recently that kind of bugged me, you know, something will get under your skin sometimes. And I was like, okay, thank you, sensei. And what did that do? Literally, even as I'm moving forward to you, it helped me to lean in and say, what is the lesson here for me to learn? And it gives me more compassion for my next interaction with that person. And it, it it humbles me and challenges me to be grateful even for the hard things. So I love that. Don't bypass them, recognize them, and find what you can be grateful for in the midst of them. I love this. I love this podcast. I love, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this is such a good one. I know you have to go. I'm going to wrap up before we we open the panel for some questions. Yeah. But just a couple more Um what would you tell your 20 year old self? Uh, this, this might sound right, but I think I really would say this, um, you know, you don't have to try so hard to fit in again. When I was saying that thing in middle school, it happened in my twenties too. I'm pretty sure I actually at that time, and you're just pulling out all the true confessions from me, Zora. But I <laughs> I was looking for a guy to make me okay. I was like, okay, as long as I have some guy interested in me, I'm okay. You know, I've got a guy on my arm. I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm accepted. I'm approved of. I'm loved. And, you know, that acceptance, approval, and affection, we all want that. We all desire that. But if you're looking for that to complete you, that's where you become a needy person and you are actually going to repel people instead of attracting them. So the thing to learn is going back to what Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. You do need to love yourself and be comfortable in your own skin. Stop trying to earn people's affection, approval, and attention, and it will come to you in time. And even if it doesn't, you won't care because mm -hmm. you're going to be so content in your own skin. Oh my gosh, we had so many great golden nuggets here. Oh, love it. <laughs> Oh, right. So I know that you have some, um, always lots of conferences and events and you just one coming up in June. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, what's happening there. Well, I called it holistic and happy because that is how I'm living and it might sound, you know, too happy to some, but come and check it out. I would love for people to come because we're going to explore how to have better relationships to the land and animals. Joel Salatin is going to speak. It's his farm in Swoop, Virginia will be at Mary Ruddick, my fellow experiential anthropologist, will be with us. And she overcame an autoimmune condition that had her flattened out on bed. Like she was, for years, the doctors thought she was going to die, basically. And now she is one of the most radiant people I know. And she's a, an ancestral nutritionist. She's also traveled the world and examined people's diets. So we're going to talk about our relationship to food, our relationship to the land and animals. Stanton Hom is going to come and talk. He's a pediatric chiropractor. He's going to talk about our relationship to our children, the next generation. And I'm going to talk about our relationship to others and to the great spirit. So um, it's going to be amazing. I cannot wait. It's June 10th at Polyface. And if people just go to holistichilda.com, they can find out more about it and sign up. 
Oh, I love it. And I, if I remember there was a, there's limited tickets and, uh, yeah. cause I guess you want to keep the group at a certain spe- per size and it's actually very affordable. I, do you remember the price? Cause I, yeah, remember I think it was- it's like one thirty five. and yes, for a full day and an amazing poly face lunch, it can't That's be great. beat. If I can just say Zora, like I've gone to a lot of conferences, you're in hotel rooms under chandelier, artificial light. You're mm-hmm. like, is it raining outside? I have no idea this is a whole different vibe. We, you know, meet outside and there's a little covering in case it does rain, but you're near the chickens and you get a little farm tour and you see the cows and it's like, oh my gosh, this is what life is supposed to be. So it gives you a glimpse of that because I'm also about experiences and having people feel how they can feel as opposed to just, you know, hearing somebody talk. So there will be a lot of interactions and, and positive vibes going on. I love this. It's so true. I've I've been to a couple of biohacking conferences last year and and everybody knew how wrong it was to sit yeah. indoors with the artificial yeah. lighting. Like we'd all try to go out a little bit and get some, you know, sunshine, but it's true. It, it's this is the true biohacking experience is actually outdoors and under a tent and and in nature. So I think that's such a cool idea and I, I wish I were there in June, but I'm I'm not going to be, I'm still in Europe then, but next time I hope to make it. And okay. I, I, I know that there's a discount. You said happy 10. Yes, happy 10. Off. But yeah. also I want to tell you, I might be coming to Spain in late June, early July. So if you're still there, let's get together. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh, that'll be great to see you in It'll person. Be so fun. Yes. We can do some, some fun recordings or reels or yeah. something together. Yeah, 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 totally. Cool. So before I let you go and or before we open the, you have, how much yes. time do you have? Just because I, I don't know. I do have time. I can do 15 okay. minutes. I want to honor that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So anyone have questions here, you can undo the mic or you can raise your hand and I can call on you or you can type in the chat. There's Carla, Susie, want to start a comment? <laughs> if you know Holistic Hilda, it would be great to know what how you know. Susie, everyone's so shy. And that's fine. I can see if I have something else I want to share that I didn't get to say. Um, Feel free to unmute or, or type in the comments, you guys. And all right. And some people sometimes are driving. I pick on them and they're like, I'm driving. Hey, Kim. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Hilda. Kim Hay. Hey. Um, you know, are you ever considering doing a retreat um, with the Indigenous people? Something like, I would love to go on something like that. Oh, thank you for um, asking. You know, it's funny that you should say that because when I was last with Mary Ruddick, we wondered about that. You know, there's a sense in which... <sighs> It's hard, right? Because we don't want to become the Westerners that invoke change in their communities. I, when we were in Mongolia, for example, we went to some homes where they would offer us candy and Mary and I were like, what are they doing? Why are they offering us candy? Because they think that's what Westerners like. (laughs) And also because they have traveled afar. And when I say afar, I'm not kidding, you know, like on their little motorbikes or by camel or horseback, like miles and miles and miles, if not days, to get candy from the town and bring it back. So to them, it's something precious they're giving. But it made us sad because it shows how, you know, the Western ways are creeping in. And in Wunger, one family we went to visit, um, we were traveling with some other Mongolians. And those Mongolians we were traveling with brought them like, I kid you not, Lay's potato chips and like this other stuff. And we're like, don't do this to them, you know, because once they taste one, literally, as a commercial is used to say, you can't just eat one, you know, they're going to keep eating it and wanting it. And it's like, we were so sad. So to answer your question, Kim, we would like to do that. And at the same time, we don't want to um, kind of muddy the waters of the beautiful places they are. So, but I will yeah. keep that in mind, because I'm going to see Mary again soon. Obviously, she's coming to my event in June, but I think there must be a way um, to not change their situation too much. Funnily enough, when we were in Mongolia too, sometimes they would try to serve us like eggs or, you know, other, let's say pancakes or something. And we were like, wait, what? No, we want to eat what you eat. And they were shocked. They were like, you're the first people, the first tourists or people that not, not from this area to come here who wanted to eat our food. So 
wow. we want to keep them doing their thing and, and and just kind of come alongside if possible. So it's good to know that you're interested. You're sparking that idea in my mind once again to address with Mary and see what we can come up with. Yeah, I see your point. It's a fine line, but I loved watching your journey there. It was so oh, beautiful and inspiring. I wanted to be with you. <laughs> well, girl, let me just tell you, I am going to Switzerland this July. And though I don't know what indigenous people I could find in Switzerland, there must be some somewhere, right? But I'm going, <laughs> I'm going with a friend and um, we are going to see like the Lechenthal Valley where Dr. Price first did meet some people who were isolated from modernity and so forth. And we will do some hiking. So, you know, I don't think I have that on my website yet, but you could go to the bordeauxkitchen.com. That's my friend Tanya Teshke's site. Cause I want my favorite thing, Kim, and you might've picked this up Zora too, is being with people. Like I'm not needy anymore, but I love them. I love people. I think they're so interesting. You know, they're just Same. fascinating and we exchange energy. I just have the best time being with people. So I try to do as many in-person things as I can. And um, also not knowing where you're from, Kim, because I forget, even though I think we've crossed paths before, um, I'm doing an event at Sally's Farm at the end of this month, celebrating the 10 million download milestone mark. So wherever I can, whenever I can, I'd love to get together with people. So whether it's in Switzerland or Maryland, I'm I'm around. Just, yeah, follow me yeah. on felicitafelda.com to see where I'm going to be next. I'm on the West Coast. You and I spoke about doing a collaboration last year. Aha. Oh my gosh. Yes. It's all coming back to me. Well, I'm going to be coming to the West coast um, for sure in, is it June? Um, I forget, June, but I'm Spain coming in again. June. <laughs> I know. Well, Spain is later in June, but earlier in June, I might be going to California too. So anyways, let's keep in touch, Kim, just DM me or something. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks for today. Yeah, you're welcome. Carla, I see you. Do you have a question or a comment? No, no, I was just going to say hello to Hilda. I, I met you at the retreat. Yes. Um, yes, right. Back then, it was good. And I think, Zora, I met you with Bob Sawyer. Yes. 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 Right. That's right. Bob who's connected me and Hilda because he said, you guys are so much alike. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And Bob is a connector. So <laughs> yes, he yes. is. Yes, yes. That's right. Yeah. Oh, right. well done. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. So yeah, yeah, you're hitting all the good stuff. Yes. Yes. And we were, was it at a Take Back Your Health conference we were on? Yeah. Yeah. Those are so yeah. fun. Robin Shirley is so sweet. Yes, She's doing yes. another one this April. I can't go to that one because I'm, if I could, I would, but I have to chop myself up into a million little pieces. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good to see you. I'm glad to be here. Good to see you too. Thanks for joining. Yeah, a lot of these names look familiar. I'm like, hey, I know these people. Yeah, this is great. It's, it's, it's great to have this community. And I think my community, I'm so glad to introduce you to my community because yes. I like everything that you do and I know that it will resonate. And you have a very... Uh, do it, it done a very different perspective, but you know, in the biohacking community, we're all about research and doctors and medicine. And even though, you know, we do hit on a lot of ancestral stuff as well, I'd like to bring in the a little bit more of that ancient wisdom, which is what you're doing now today. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And just to go back to Bob. So he's our friend. I think he's Breathe Your Power on Instagram or something, but he does cold plunges. And I think a year or two ago when I did a cold plunge in Minnesota, there was a woman definitely, I think she was in her 80s, actually. And what was she doing by getting in that cold water? Some people would say she's crazy. She actually stays, she lives like in a nursing home. She's like, if my friends could see me now, but you know what she was doing? She was pushing past self-imposed or societally imposed limitations. She was challenging her body. Now she wasn't being unwise. We were all there to help and we all help each other through these things, you know, but she was going to see what she could do. And it was amazing. I mean, I, I I still can picture her now coming out of the water with this huge grin on her face, like I did it. And this builds new neural pathways in our brains, by the way, when we have new experiences. And what happens to us as we age is, you know, we might start to settle kind of like the pulp in the bottom of an orange juice jug, right? Like it just kind of starts to settle. And we do the same thing. We watch the same shows. We have the same experiences. The doing something novel is so good for the brain and the spirit. You could not replace Ellie's grin or feeling for with anything, you know, with a t funny TV show. No, it's not the same thing as having that experience. So whether you join me in Switzerland or Polyface or Maryland or whether you, 
decide today, hey, I'm going to go outside with without a jacket on just to challenge myself. I'll be cold. Yes, you will be cold. We're not going to pretend it's not cold. But you're saying, hey, I can be out here for five minutes and I didn't die. And that's a good thing. And so that's kind of surprise your body. And I think this element is really important for growth, trying new things, learning new things, you know, sparking those you know brand new neural pathways, because if you're not growing like a plant, you're dying. And so I'd rather live as long as possible and have that rapid morbidity, you know, than die longer, if that makes sense. Absolutely. In in gerontology, we we studied a lot about dementia and Alzheimer's and these diseases of aging. And, and in fact, learning new things is so, so neuroprotective. It gives you that neuroplasticity. And we know that now you can teach an old dog new tricks. We used to not think that way. And so really I encourage everyone, no matter what age you are, to always get a little bit out of your comfort zone and, and try new things. It's good for your health. It's good for your brain. And it, it's empowering. I think you you feel empowered and you feel stronger and, and more connected, right? Absolutely. I think that's one of my dad's secrets. He's constantly learning new languages. The man is 91. Like I'm just like, <laughs> what are you doing? But no wonder his brain is sharp as a tack. I played him at Jeopardy the other day and he totally crushed me. I was like, what? <laughs> um, so, you know, he's keeping those things going. He's, you know, challenging himself. Crossword puzzles, they always say, you know, but it can be anything you want. Just keep learning. I think that's a good word, Zora. Mm. So everyone can find you on your website called holistichilda.com. Yep. They can listen to the Wise Traditions podcast. They've got you on a YouTube channel, which is also Holistic Hilda. Um, Instagram, same thing. I'll have all the, the links to you in the show notes. And one thing before I let you go is, is a big part of our audience is a, is a woman going through menopause. Do you have any last words for her? You've given already so many great nuggets, but anything you'd like to say before I let you go? I think I would say you are beautiful. You are absolutely beautiful. And you're just where you're supposed to be right now. You're growing, you're changing. That's part of life. Embrace it, embrace it. I know it's hard for, it, it has varying levels of difficulty, just like labor. Some people have back labor, which is supposed to be the worst ever. Some have it like, oh, the baby slid out and was wearing a baseball cap and ready to go. You know, it's like <laughs> different for everybody, right? So I'm not trying to negate the challenges that come with this season of life, but I would say there's something beautiful in there. You know, maybe you're going, you're doing that shift from the, you know, ingenue, the young, you know, doe-eyed, you know, person to that wise elder. So embrace it, embrace it with curiosity and you will, you know, find some beauty somewhere in there, if not on the other side. Oh, wonderful words. Thank you so much. I, I hope everyone here has been listening. Have a great day. Good night. Good morning, wherever they're at. You too, Hilda. You have a great morning, I think, in your part of the world. And hopefully we'll see you again for another chapter. Yes, I would love that. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in.